if you can, Fee. And welcome, welcome to everybody that's just joining us. We're just going into our, our second part of this session um, and we're moving straight across to, um, to Leo and Verena in a second. And I'm just um, thanking PebblePad for being our sponsors for this session. So thank you very much, PebblePad. I know there will be people very interested in that who are in the chat already. Okay, I'm gonna pass you over now. I'm just gonna stop these slides. Are you okay to get yours ones up, Leo? If not, give me a yep, shout. Yep, sure. Great, okay, pass you over then. Lovely. Thanks, Leo. OK, hi, everyone. Um, it's uh, Leo Havman here, and I'm joined by um, one of my partners in crime, Verena Roberts. Um, and, um, and we have this, um, this idea that um, we, should, we should have a, um, a discussion or we should offer a discussion at this um, conference about um, pandemic pedagogy um, and um, and as we um, developed our ideas we discovered that there was there was more even more to it than we than we at first thought so our, our um, yeah so our sort of sub theme here is social presence in the viral learning environment um, just to quickly introduce ourselves uh, so I'm based in London in the UK I uh, work at University College London as a digital education advisor. I'm um, also a, a PhD student at the Open University. Uh, my research is around open and digital practices and policies in higher education. I'm a member of the GoGN network um, and also one of the coordinators of the M25 Learning Technology Group, which is a SIG of old. Um, and um, it's through through sort of through um, Twitter and general knowing the same people, but ultimately also through GoGN that Verena and I have got to know each other. And uh, maybe, Verena, would you like to introduce yourself a bit too? Thank you, Leo. Yes, Leo and I are partners in crime, and I come to you as a penguin from Canada. I'm uh, Dr. Verena Roberts, and the irony is that literally downstairs in a room, a very closed room with 50 people, I'm expected to go downstairs after we finish this um, and meet with my high school. A uh, group which is quite exciting and scary at the same time. I'm a learning designer with the ETS group at uh, the University of British Columbia. I'm a sessional instructor with U Victoria and U Calgary, and I have been literally teaching online courses nonstop since January. I've been given lots of opportunities again and again to teach in different ways, which is really exciting and will come into play in our chat today. I'm also an educational specialist with a nonprofit called Cybera here in Canada, with, which focuses on open data science and coding. And most importantly, I would say as well, I'm a mom to three kids, and I survived so far the K-12 remote access learning, although two, student, two of my kids are going back online uh, next week. So let's get going. So what is, what is this about? Sorry, I think we advanced a little bit. To, I think you we're both it. moving this slide. <laughs> um, so um, this, um, sorry, the text wasn't meant to be this um, faint, but anyway, um, this is a, a slightly uh, shortened version of the the abstract. The the long one is, of course, on the on the site. But um, essentially, that this was prompted by the the fact that um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there was such a huge demand in terms of just moving, just getting online, getting everything online in any kind of uh, possible way um, uh, as, as rapidly as we could. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, it's certainly some um, questioning going on around, um, you know, are we doing things in the, the way that we would like to do them and, and hoping that we were going to be able to refine our approach um, and uh, really help our colleagues to um, to get um, get more more confident and more uh, sort of um, adept in um, online teaching, um, heading towards the autumn as it became clearer that the autumn was also going to be um, <clears throat> very much uh, an online focused kind of experience as well. And um, and so uh, so really. Um, one of the, the things I think that led us to want to talk about this was our, our sense of frustration that a lot of the discussion around all of this was uh, was happening kind of in a strange kind of parallel universe where people seem to have the 
the capacity to discuss and engage with the ideas um, where for like certainly in my world I was just completely focused on just uh, attending all the meetings that I had every day sometimes like five to six hours of meetings a day and um, and then trying to sort of do the things that were emerging from um, you know what we decided to do during the meetings or what, what was being asked of us and um, so that it was a uh, um, a, a time that that we didn't have a lot of time to be putting our ideas out into the world, um, and um, and we were interested in the volume um, of the ideas as well as what they were that were coming from from other other people, um, and um, and so so we wanted to kind of reflect on like basically where have we been and where are we going at this stage um, with with COVID and education. Over to you, Verena. Yeah, sorry about that. So okay. I was going through my phone. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I was going through my yeah. phone and I started to look at some of the different slides that I've taken off. And no, they're not all CC licensed. They're literally things I took off the screen um, or just from Twitter or from Instagram. Uh, that literally I was taking pictures of the newspaper every day because at my university there were all sorts of things going on like all of a sudden the students could opt out of letter grades and they didn't even understand what was going on. Um, there were incredible things happening where students were coming together and defeating apps and figuring out how to use um, technology in ways that teachers couldn't even believe or, or even political systems couldn't understand as we've seen. And finally, um, as a teacher, it is also often been criticized. YouTube has been criticized or digital learning has been criticized. And now all of a sudden we all looked like the YouTubers that we see in this picture right here. I looked at my horoscope daily. It's a lot of time spent at home and as a mom working from home, that is not me, but that was a picture taken from Instagram, and that's definitely how I felt. Um, and then there's also the picture in the middle, and that is me, and that's when I was in two different web conferences at the same time. On the left, I was presenting, and on the right, I was actually in a meeting. Um, so I think we can all relate to these slides in different ways. If in the chat, did anyone relate to any of these experiences in any way? You're welcome. I don't know if you can actually put in a, a of an image as well. Yeah, so I'm seeing some people can relate to this. But in the middle of all this chaos, we wanted to think about what are we what are we actually learning in terms of learning designers? Because Leo and I can't help it. All we do is reflect and think. And so even though all this chaos was going on and we couldn't live breathe and we we we, we were struggling with what was going on and the expectations, we really wanted to look at the positives and see how we were all responding to this crisis. So pandemic pedagogy, uh, what, what, what do we even mean by it? Um, at first, I just thought I like the alliteration. Um, but then um, I thought, well, the obvious question here is how do we teach and learn in the context of the pandemic? But I feel that there's a second question here, which has been more emergent, which is what is the pandemic teaching us? At the beginning of this, we didn't realize we would have so much to learn. As time went on, we would see how the pandemic exposed and magnified inequalities. And we've heard quite a bit about that um, throughout this conference. Um, and I think that um, man, many of us um, who, um, who were fortunate enough not to realize it have realized how fragile our normal is. And uh, so as a way of thinking about this in maybe a more playful way, and, and I'm, I'm glad that um, we ended up doing it in a, in a playful way for one of the, the, the last sessions of the conference, um, we, um, we started thinking about identities and narratives in the early pandemic and how perhaps these were evolving as it's continued. And so we uh, we came up with these these uh, ideas about ostriches, owls, and vultures as being some of the um, the pandemic identities. Should we have the pictures? We've got nice pictures of them for you to look at while we while we ask you um, who might be our um, <laughs> our uh, ostriches, our um, our owls, and our vultures in the pandemic um, educational landscape. So thinking back to those first, that first month, did anyone come across as a vulture, an owl, or an ostrich, in your opinion? And not names, 
<laughs> generalizations. Thank you, Dom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we have ed techs as owls. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone else have some ideas? Penguins. We forgot the penguins, Leo. How could we forget the penguin? We we also were trying to uh, um, figure out how it related to Audrey Waters' pigeons, um, but in the end we 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 couldn't. So uh, there's no pigeons either. Um, no. We did have. <laughs> yes, to thanks, Martin. Them. Vulture ed tech company. Oh, vultures! There we go. Martin got it. We're thinking more vultures or ed tech. Ada and an owl. Yeah. Yeah, we've got some uh, some ostriches. Um, ostriches who <laughs> as uh, some of our our colleagues who remain nameless um exactly so uh i think i think you see where we're uh where we're going with this and uh, we thought in terms of the the narratives that, that, that these identities related to we, the ostrich narrative is um yeah good good point from sharon as well we, um, i think we, we think that as well um one of the the narratives was maybe this will all just go away um and um, and this obviously related to the ostrich identity. Um, sorry, Verena, you were going to explain this slide. No, 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 no. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, so specifically, um, also we wanted. To, yeah, no, the next slide. Sorry, I'm getting messed up with my slides. There we go. The other, the other really important element was the free for five minutes phase. Um, I didn't take enough shots of all the different opportunities that I was given as a K-12 um, educator for free products, free digital access, um, free, uh, free opportunities to be in a learning platform. But my favorite was free open access until June, specifically June 30th, 2020. I, that was really the date for every one. And I did find this shot that said free resources, but this slide will be updated as resources become available. And that's kind of the feeling um, of what happened a lot of time. The free came with an ending or at a cost. And we're going to talk a little bit about where was OER in all of this. The the the, the how how did that um, it, how was it an opportunity for OER or did it get missed? Or, or did the vultures kind of overshadow? Or did, did other people kind of step in and offer free products that have now, in many cases, disappeared? So go ahead, Leo. Um, so another, um, I think, really key narrative of this, of this period was, um, was one that, I, that in, in the end I've summarized as this is our moment. And I think that this actually was, uh, was prominent across various different variations of of, of identity, but um, but which we were kind of relating to um, the owls, and I'll explain the owls from our from our uh, perspective a bit more. So the wise owls, whether they were long-standing or brand new experts and thought leaders, um, uh, sometimes were presenting a um, and and of course also. Um, some of us, uh, you know, felt ourselves to be wise owls, but we're not necessarily um, very visible <laughs> in in, uh, in the, um, the the more public um, sphere of this. Um, that this is maybe the educational variant on the live your best life narrative that was circulating more broadly um, in the the kind of early pandemic. Um, this is the one that says, uh, now you're going to go on a diet, get fit, learn a musical instrument. This time at home is a gift horse. You'd better not look in the mouth. Um, it was exhorting us to be good neoliberal subjects and use the time productively. And of course, um, some of us, though, were already using all of our time um, and more um, quite productively, leaving no time for self-improvement and not much for self-care. And it was tempting, nonetheless, to be caught up in the idea that this is our moment. Um, it wasn't only for those who had wanted to sell um, ebooks, ed tech solutions, or leading thoughts. It was also um, perhaps tempting for staff within organizations supporting online learning to hope that uh, despite feeling some discomfort with the idea of pandemic as opportunity, that this was our moment to recruit academic staff um, to this, this cause that we've we put put so much work, so much of our careers into, to be recognized for our expertise in it, to stave off disaster in the short term, um, but also to make lasting improvements to teaching and learning through increased engagement and baseline knowledge. 
Um, yeah, I just, don't blame uh, you for banning the word opportunity. <laughs> yes. I, I, I remember my moment, and actually this was from a principal who sent me a tweet saying, Rita, this is your moment. I didn't have a job in that moment other than being a sessional instructor. And, and all you could see me doing is tweeting about open educational resources. So that shows you the moment and what the reality was for me. We, we, I went from no job to like looking for a job in that moment, um, and then I was completely inundated and had no time. So the idea of the opportunity for me to share ideas or to to lead, I still have it, but it definitely hasn't happened. <laughs> we'll just say that. Catherine, the musical then, version is coming. <laughs> say it again, please. Catherine, Catherine says which this should be a should be a musical slide. Um, oh, yes, I know. Sorry, carry on, Marina. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. I agree. There should be music sliding. And Catherine pointed that out too. And then there was the reality of trauma and, and really accepting the fact that we were in this too. <laughs> it was almost like we forgot just because we were part of online learning before that we wouldn't be as traumatized. And even though I put those pictures out there and I was looking at it and, and thinking about it, it was it came to a point that I had to accept that I was in this traumatic experience like everyone else. Leo? Leo's having too much fun. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, figuring, figuring out where I where I am. Um, oh no, you just have to speak on trauma. Trauma is everyone. There I we think go. we we no, yeah, we I think that we are. Uh, I mean, we we all we all know. Um, and um, and so so coming back to our I guess to, to our um, our theme here. Um, one of the, the uh, interesting features of the um, the response in the wider society to COVID has been the um, the phrasing of social distancing, the idea that we 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 all need to be distant from each other. But of course, this is really about physical distancing, um, and um, and you know it's quite um, it's quite strange in the when we th we're thinking in an online learning context, we're actually uh, we're often much more concerned about social presence and uh, kind of how to develop and sustain that and foster that and encourage that. And, um, and uh, so uh, one of the great challenges um, we think has been um, for the staff that, that have been moving from the um, kind of classroom based um, face to face uh, teaching mode into into this new modality and, um, and tempted to just try and sort of um, replicate but with zoom um, has been um, trying to 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 think more about prioritizing presence and care i do think though that one of the reasons that it's been quite tempting from for many staff to want to do these kind of um, synchronous live uh, streamed um, lecture sessions um, has been be has actually been because they've sensed the the desire on the part of students to kind of have their presence and they they find the idea of developing presence in a different way is quite um it they don't necessarily know how to go around doing that so um so we we're going to talk about a bit here about some of the um things that uh, some of the things from our own experiences of, of our of our work in this um context would you want to um start so in my experiences as i said consistently teaching online, I think one of the biggest humbling experiences was realizing that I, I, I didn't actually know as much as I thought I might have done about online learning. Um, specifically, the trauma, the need to be flexible, the fact that students now had no access, it was amplified. It wasn't like it wasn't there before, but it was amplified and equity was amplified in ways that were previously inconceivable. As a result, um, I definitely started to shift my practice even more to what's called human-centered learning. Um, specifically, what I did as an actual practitioner during the sessional um, courses was that I would create what's called social pods. And social pods are either informal or formal learning um, groups where the students are put together in groups either by the instructor or they choose their own groups and they do activities and work together online in their own way in, in their own time throughout the week but the activities are designed by the instructor and encouraged by the instructor. 
Um, the reason this evolved in particular was because some students really wanted synchronous sessions every week, and I literally couldn't maintain that as an instructor. So I had to come up with some kind of asynchronous support network for the students. And in some cases, they would do group work together and they would have some kind of assessment. But in many cases, it was um, working on blogs together or working on questions together with their discussion threads and not making everything on online in terms of online in my course or online wherever our digital space was. So the social pod idea has really expanded. It also expanded into my work as a learning designer with UBC. And I was working with kinesiology um, professors and they loved the idea of supporting their students in some kind of way, especially with courses where you had 300, 400 students. And so they've started to design ways to encourage these social pods. And the only other thing I would add is another way to learn is I've been lucky enough to work with instructors who realized that it's not about the online, it's not about the medium, and that online learning is about learning. And so they're really excited about the positive and the potential. And they just said they'd never think about it before if they hadn't been given this opportunity. Leo, you wanted to say something quick about connected learning? I, I do want to say something something quick, but aware of our five minute warning. Um, so I, I will be quick. Um, but uh, because Verena and I have worked a, a kind of um, kind of in a sense on the same problem but in a, a kind of I, I guess a bit different scales in this um, situation um, in in my role what what a lot of what I've been doing has been trying to come up with um, ways that we can kind of um, push push out um, messages uh, to kind of the the, the wider swathes of the um, the UCL community and um and we one of the things that we were asked to do was to develop a kind of a standard or a, or an approach or a, 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 a kind of a, a good practice um, checklist for um, teaching online and uh, and we said well okay that's that's okay because actually we um, we have that um, we had a um, the UCL e-learning baseline and traditionally it and it's evolved over the years and um, I, I've kind of become one of the the, the people that generally uh, does revisions to it and kind of looks after it in a way and um, and um, and but traditionally it's always been divided into the kind of the baseline and then baseline plus for the courses which are taught completely online which are quite a, a, a kind of a, a, a distinct um, and, and minority kind of group and where we were asking people to do a lot more so what we did was we merged the um, baseline plus into the regular baseline and we also kind of uh, rewrote it in ways where we tried to emphasize tutor presence, communication, um, support, um, very, very much in, um, in line with, um, as um, Aris was saying during the Gojian um, Gasta yesterday about, uh, with the idea that students will probably remember how they felt at this time and really how we supported them and how we guided them and, you know, the, the sense in which we, um, we, we said, you know, don't worry, we're all going to get through this together, rather than what specifically they were learning. And so prioritizing that sense of the, you know, that we are a community and that there is care, um, making that a bit more um, front and center rather than um, content. And, um, and so, the, um, so we, we also rebranded the baseline as the uh, connected learning baseline rather than just the e-learning baseline. And uh, because we wanted to, rather than call it, call it distance learning, we wanted to emphasize the idea that we are still connected, even though we might not be uh, meeting up in the same, um, in the same space. Um, and, um, and various other um, uh, aspects of our work have kind of built off of, off of the, this. Um, this is a kind of an underlying um, approach, including a, a staff development course called Connected Learning Essentials, which I'm thrilled to say actually, um, uh, 900 of our staff did in the first um, run and um, and it's been you know smaller groups as it's subsequently been rerun but um, but I you know we've we've really um, seen a lot of engagement from our staff with it so we're hoping that this all of this kind of uh, stuff is making a big difference and we're hoping that our next um, our next avian identity um, that, that we're all tr uh, transforming into is a phoenix 
um, and that at the end of this, you know, we'll be fe will be phoenixes rising from the, the flames of this rather than um, that they'll just be scorched earth. Um, so that is pretty much where we wanted to wrap up. Um, I think but we did we did if there's a, if there is any time we thought we'd be delighted to know um, what what people think um, might emerge from this period um, after the kind of initial uh, initial crisis um, what kind of online learning are we looking at in our institutions oh thanks thanks ever so much Leo um, I was going to say if people if anybody would like the mic um, just let me know in the chat or put your hand up and I can just quickly give you the mic. Um, uh, that was really good. Wow, I was, I've was i been so lucky in the sessions that I've been given, mind you all of them have been so good. <laughs> um, really, really, um, really interesting stuff you've um, you've raised and um, online kind of social presence is stuff I'm really interested in. There's my timer look to tell me to stop talking. <laughs> Um, I know that um, uh, the Marin has uh, started to say that people are starting to move into the into the final plenary. So, um, it, but if anybody would like to either comment or to um, to ask a question, please do pop it in the chat quickly. Um, or if it's quicker and you'd like the mic, you can have a very quick opportunity to um, to thank everyone or to um, to let us know if you have a quick question. But thanks very much to all of our speakers. Really, really appreciate your effort. Really appreciate everybody coming along as well and showing your support and um, enjoying these excellent sessions that we've had. I'm just quickly scrolling through the chat. I don't see any questions for you, Leo, uh, Verena? But I'm sure if you, if anybody wants to get in touch, that um, they can find you very easily all over Twitter. <laughs> Lovely. Lots of love in the room for you. Lots of penguins. Excellent. Thank you ever so much. I don't think there's any more questions. Thanks, folks. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you.